If you're like me, you're probably super stoked for all the films and shows that Marvel have recently announced for the next few years, but it kind of all got me thinking, how did superheroes actually begin? Where did superheroes come from? How have they changed over time? How has society influenced superheroes? Well, with the help of comic book historian Alex Grant, I'm going to explore the origin story of superheroes themselves and how they relate to our society. Let's go back to the very beginning. Who was the first superhero? There, there's the overall answer, which is Superman, because it has a lot of elements of previous heroes before that, but presented in a way that has a science fiction principle, which usually superheroes have, as well as the having a cape, doing fantastic things, but ultimately having a mission of defending the weak. You need to have a mission to be a superhero that has to do with something above yourself. So these are basically the three elements that you need to be a superhero. There's having a super ability or superpowers, having a mission to help others, and having an iconic look or costume. Superman was the first comic book superhero because it was the first thing to combine all three of these elements in a successful way. However, the idea of super characters doing super things had already existed before Superman. So you have like spring Heel Jack in the 1880s, which was like a Batman kind of character. And you have Nicholas Carter, a detective, but these aren't comics, uh, but they are kind of super characters. If you look at that ship that's taking baby Superman away from Krypton, that's the same ship that's on the cover of Amazing Stories 1935, but it doesn't have a super character in this. Then you have this baby that is defying the scientist's analysis, and that same concept was in Gladiator in 1930. So with Action Comics number one, it's the way all these ideas, which may have been drawn from other sources, were combined and packaged in this one epic comic book that makes Superman the first comic book superhero. Easy, miss. I've got you. you you've got me? Who's got you? <laughs> Superman as a new genre in the comic book format sold super well, so all of a sudden you have other companies jumping on the superhero bandwagon, and this starts what's known as the golden age of comic books. And suddenly you have a bunch of characters coming out. All American comics had Wonder Woman, and they had Green Lantern and Flash. And of course you have timely comics with the Submariner, that's the 1939 piece. And you have DC comics also creating their own similar caped figure, but that's Batman, right? So thanks to the success of Superman, you now have comic books everywhere and the golden age is in full swing. However, there is a really big difference between the golden age in the late 30s and the 40s. And this is because of what's happening in the world at the time. The late 30s golden age is heavily influenced by the Great Depression and the 40s, World War II. It was more like they were venting the frustration of the writers. The writers didn't really have an editor saying, oh, you can't write it like that. The writers, Jerry Siegel was like, I'm gonna teach society for making me poor from the Great Depression. There was an anger in a lot of this stuff. Once World War II starts, the comic book superhero then becomes a post-World War II superhero, which is actually quite different. Also, in 1941, the DC editors create a code that now says that superheroes have to stand for something. They can't just be writing anything. So suddenly, you have a pre-World War II Golden Age that's all about revenge on society, and then you have a post-World War II Golden Age which is about being a superhero, representing America's interests, and embodying a real-life event that was World War II. And it still sold well, and it didn't upset parents. Series E defense bonds. Each one you buy is a bullet in the barrel of your best guy's gun. Once the war had ended, the soldiers came home, they settled down, and they no longer wanted all the action that was present in the superhero comics. Superheroes weren't really selling anymore because there weren't soldiers that needed that escapism of like fighting the bad guy. Also, it was so propaganda driven, those comics, that once the war stopped, they almost kind of weren't sure what to do content wise they're like should we keep should we keep punching nazis i mean we won so now what do we do now that people didn't care about superheroes anymore the comics all returned to genres like romance crime science fiction war comics satire like mad and even horror comics marvel comics by issue 93 became marvel tales and it was now a horror comic once the world had moved away from world war ii and then into the television age the comics more reflected what was on tv so what brings back the superhero? Essentially, all these non-superhero comic books just became corrupt after a while. On the covers you had decapitated women, people getting shot, and kids are buying these comics, bringing them home, and their parents are thinking, what the hell is all this? 
Parents then start to complain to local politicians, all of a sudden there's a Senate hearing, and the government is trying to find a link between comic books and juvenile delinquency. Although a connection was never found, there was so much backlash that the comic book industry had to change. People from both DC Comics and Archie Comics got together and created what's called the Comics Code Authority in 1954. They made a deal with the newsstands, saying if this, if the comic has this symbol on it, it means it's okay for newsstands and there won't be mothers angry about you selling it to their kids. A lot of places end up going out of business, but one of the genres that could survive was superheroes, mainly Superman and Batman. This was because Superman before the Comics Code was clearly content that was kid-friendly. Therefore, they were able to survive under the new Comics Code Authority and make money. This eventually led to comic books basically becoming superheroes for kids, and a lot of adults would lose interest, and you now have what's called the Silver Age of comic books. And that's where the real revolution happens in superheroes, which is Showcase 4, where you have a lot of elements. You have that clean, kid-friendly style that's present in this Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen book. But then you also have this idea of an everyday man gaining like energy-based powers in a bizarre science fiction event, and then also discovering those powers and becoming a better person through self-discovery and discovering the world around them in this new lens of through their new powers. And that formula ends up selling so well that then you have like other comics starting to do that. You have Spider-Man having the same kind of thing as Flash. Like he's a science kid, radioactive spider hits him. He gets powers in the similar recipe that Flash does where he's also discovering it. Why does he have these powers? It's like you have an everyday guy and this is all science fiction and it's all the return of the superhero, but it's different. Instead of them being immediately perfect people, the difference here is they're insecure and almost like trying to keep up with what's going on. So then all of a sudden, DC has retconned The Flash, they create a new Wonder Woman and a new Green Lantern, different from the Golden Age one who now has a science fiction based origin story. And then DC puts all these characters together, Wonder Woman, The Flash, Aquaman, Green Lantern and Martian Manhunter, and they create the Justice League of America. And this is a comic that does super well in the Comics Code era, so now the other companies want to copy it. And so then the Fantastic Four is made, and you can see even the dynamics of this page look like the Starro page next to it. Like, even the high point is on the top left, and the recessive point is on the bottom right. It's like the same dynamic. Now Marvel has the very own super team. But there is a funny thing about this first Fantastic Four issue. On the cover, it's saying featuring the four characters together for the first time in one Mighty Magazine. As if they were alone in their individuals before this, which they weren't, but it was basically to get readers to think, oh wow, all these characters together for the first time in their own comic, I better read this. But overall, the Silver Age turns these comic books into stories where science fiction makes things possible, and all of a sudden they're using their new and old characters to create a new beginning where science fiction is used to explore the world around you. And that's ultimately a sense of optimism of what was, what was going on at the time historically like you had jfk talking about that with imagine a better america and you had the beatles playing music you had muhammad ali becoming heavyweight champion and you actually have astronauts the space race that's basically the fantastic four astronauts getting powers now that science fiction makes things possible you have the return of a genre that can make money during the comics code authority great power comes great responsibility. Remember that, Pete. Remember that. Because of the things that were happening in the world during the 1970s, the Bronze Age was a return to darker plot elements and storylines more relevant to social issues like death, racism, and drug abuse. In 1970, that's when all these pieces start to fall into place. Because in 68, right, you have um, Nixon becomes president, which he actually had a, a really strong majority at the time, but culturally, a lot of the artists were disappointed by that. So suddenly that starts to reflect a little bit. Charles Manson, who was basically like hippies gone bad, start kind of killing people and that starts getting headlines. And suddenly it's like, wow, maybe this hippie movement isn't so good. Janis Joplin dies of a drug overdose. Jimi Hendrix dies drug related. And suddenly it's like, whoa, well, we thought drugs were supposed to expand our minds. Now it's like killing our own artists. The Beatles are disbanding. It's like, what the heck's going on? Things are changing. Like the paradigm is shifting. It's not about optimism anymore. It's ultimately about disappointment. Things didn't turn out the way we were promised. And now that resentment starts to build into the comics and it starts to be almost like the 1930s comes back. Superman's gonna let you die. 
that element of vengeance starts to come back. So this is essentially what the Bronze Age is, where you see the rise of the anti-hero. Characters like Conan the Barbarian come back and start to do really well. A character that will actually kill people is popular. Wolverine comes out in 1974, The Punisher is created in 74, also characters that actually kill bad guys. Blade comes out, a character that tries to kill vampires and people associated with vampires. So this is the main conversation from the 70s and while we now have this whole other section of vengeful anti-heroes that were selling super well at the time. A positive thing however to come out of the Bronze Age and the 1960s onwards was the civil rights movement. When you had individuals like Martin Luther King Jr and Malcolm X, there was a revelation amongst comic creators that we should start having minority characters. And Blade is a part of that. He's a strong African American character in comic books. At the time it was people trying to wrap their heads around issues of racism and discrimination and that the civil rights era means that we have to change the things we are doing. In 1975, in the middle of the Bronze Age, you have the all new X-Men and one of the strongest elements of this X-Men run was the multicultural cast. This is a superhero team where every costume looks different and interesting and every character is a different race. And this all stems from an urge to be more multicultural and representative in comic books. All the crime and craziness of the 1970s eventually gets cleaned up and this leads into the 80s where you have a stronger presence of law and order and the culture shifts towards an importance on money and narcissism. So a lot of people liked it, but also a lot of comic creators kind of resented it. Wall Street, the movie with uh, that Oliver Stone film, is all about greed is good, self-involvement is good. These themes start to show up in the 1980s comic books as the age of the anti-hero starts to become more about self-involvement. Alan Moore starts to comment on self-involved heroes with Watchmen. And you have Comedian, he's all about his own selfish enjoyment of, of harming others. You know, he was in the war in Vietnam and he was, you know, flamethrowing people that didn't have guns, like he liked it. And he's actually a hero, like a Nick Fury type of character that works for the government, but is actually like a, a, a bit of a sadist, I think. Rorschach, who was seen as like a commentary on the Charlton character, the question from the 1960s, Rorschach leads this war on crime like a street vigilante, like Punisher and characters like that. But ultimately when he's cracking fingers and torturing criminals, he's getting off on it. He's the one that's enjoying doing it. He likes hurting people. So it's not necessarily like I'm, I'm an anti-hero and I'm gonna kill whoever's necessary. They're doing it because they're enjoying the process of inflicting pain on someone else. Dr. Manhattan, he didn't enjoy hurting people, but he didn't enjoy much of anything. He was just kind of into science and he would rather just play with sand and space than deal with humans and to be helpful. Alan Moore's Watchmen essentially deconstructed the superhero and turned them into a more dark, selfish, and ultimately flawed character. And ever since then, we the reader can't really seem to accept the character that doesn't have some kind of major flaw. After this, it's like, well, Tony Stark has to be an alcoholic now. He can't be just a productive person of industry. No, he's got to be an alcoholic and he has to lose everything, then gain it back. That's the only way we can really deal with it. That's the only thing that sells. That's the only thing that will resonate with people. Because ultimately now it's like, well, I want to see my own vices into these characters. People have an easier time wrapping their heads around flawed and sadomasochistic characters more so than someone that's just trying to do the right thing and is ultimately trying to discover the world in almost an innocent lens and protect. Alan Moore created a new perspective in comic books that was based on socially criticizing American culture and it became widely popular. And as a result, superheroes have never been the same since. The 90s is the era of the action film. Arnold Schwarzenegger was a really big influence in the early 90s, and those films were all about big guns, explosions, and guys with huge muscles. So then the art in comic books starts to reflect this, and the stories almost start to fall to the side, but the comic books still do really well. The X-Men were a franchise that were able to capture the aesthetic of action films, and teenagers just thought it was really cool. And as a result, X-Men did extremely well in this period. X-Men number one, released in 1991, is still the highest grossing single issue comic book of all time. Not only was it capturing the aesthetic of action films, but also there were four different varying covers that combined to make one huge picture. Therefore, people had to buy the same issue four times with the different covers. Even the packaging gets extreme, where let's have this X-Force wrapped in a collector's item bag, and it has a, a Marvel trading card inside, and now you have to get that, and then one that you can actually open and read. Let's have die cut covers. Let's have holograms on issues. So now it's like extreme sales, extreme buying. So this boom was all early 90s. You have a revamp of almost the entire genre in the image of action films, and a lot of titles are getting rebooted back to issue number one. At first, of course, readers loved it and this new aesthetic, but after a few months, you get a couple issues in and readers really started to lose interest. 
and they realize that these issues won't be worth millions like the ones in the golden age because there's so many copies of them. So there's now more product than buyers and the collector's market kind of starts to crash. Also at this time, creators from big companies start to jump ship and they create their own company, Image Comics, where they kind of have more freedom and creative control and this starts to do really well. Marvel and DC almost can't keep up with everything that's going on. As a result, Marvel end up going bankrupt and now Marvel and DC are kind of forced to clean everything up. As a result, comics in the mid 90s start to become really mundane and they are not selling as well as they used to. Comics by this point have definitely started to lose focus and they're not really sure what to do. Once movies like Blade comes out in 1998 and the X-Men in 2000, there's suddenly a compass of how to point the material in comic books. During the Marvel bankruptcy period, they sold a lot of their movie rights of their characters to other companies. Spider-Man went to Sony, X-Men went to Fox Studios, and so on. Once these films came out and were huge successes, you start to see similarly how action films influence comic books, now it's the superhero films that are influencing the comic books. There were other influences, like the period of 9-11 and the Bush era really birthed a patriotic period in America, but ultimately it became about if you could make a superhero film, why not make the superhero comic more like the film that was successful? Maybe we can change how we write the comics, so maybe we can make Tony Stark more like Robert Downey Jr. now. And then ultimately now a lot of new creators, even if it's not Marvel, in their mind they're thinking, hey, if I can create a comic that maybe may become a movie later, or maybe a Netflix series now, it's all about like writing toward the movies, I think, in a lot of ways. I would say in more recent times, like the George Floyd event, social justice and movies are now kind of guiding a lot of comics. Now that you have these hugely successful and critically acclaimed films that are based on the source material that was successful in the other ages, the modern age is now about riding off the success of superhero films whilst continuing to incorporate world events and movements like 9-11, like the Black Lives Matter movement, just like they were originally incorporating World War II in the Golden Age. Superheroes continue to be a product of their period, just like all forms of art. The writers and artists of their time express the issues and conversations relevant to make the material interesting and ultimately resonate with their audience. So there you have it, the complete history of superheroes, from Action Comics number one to the now thriving superhero film genre. They've changed a lot. Just like society and our values as a community have changed over time, so have superheroes and the everyday individual that they embody. Thanks so much again to Alex Grant. Feel free to check him out on Comic Book Historians on YouTube. Really hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, make sure to leave a like. Maybe leave a comment. What drew you to superheroes? Feel free to subscribe to Blood Codes for more awesome video essays like this.